are listening to The Alzheimer's Podcast with Mike Good of Togetherness, your number one resource for practical tips and insights, empowering you and your family to live well with Alzheimer's. Hello and welcome to episode six of The Alzheimer's Podcast. I'm Mike Good of Togetherness. Thank you for setting aside your valuable time to join me today where my goal is always to empower you to maintain a positive experience, reduce and eliminate the need for medications, and make your time together with those you care for the best it can be. In the last couple of episodes, I've mentioned that in order to live well with Alzheimer's in your life and to maximize the positive times with your loved one, you must do some planning. Most people don't like formal planning, however, but flying by the seat of your britches is just going to perpetuate chaos, resulting in a negative experience for everyone involved. In this episode, I'm going to share some strategies and tools that I've created to help you go from being reactive to being proactive. I'll be sharing a lot of information today, and I'll be referencing several tools to help you put a plan of care into place. Now, to get the most out of this episode, you must use this episode in conjunction with the series of articles and the associated tools that I've created to help you be successful. Think of it as a working session. As you listen, don't worry about taking notes because you can reference the articles, and those articles will walk you step by step through the process. So I highly recommend after you listen to this podcast, you visit the show notes and begin implementing the strategies I will be discussing today. And although it will take a lot of commitment and a lot of work, by doing so, you will greatly reduce the emotional, physical, and financial strain you and your loved one feel each day. Whether your loved one is rehabilitating, has an age-related disease, or a progressive illness such as Alzheimer's, without a plan of care in place, their quality of life will suffer at some point. And considering the complexities of providing in-home care for a person with dementia, this could be an everyday problem. A care plan helps to ensure that the mental and physical well-being of your loved one is maximized at all times by combining their goals with yours, your family's, and those of other care partners. A care plan also reduces caregiver stress by providing direction as well as a means of communication. No matter what journey you are on, if you don't plan ahead, you will likely find yourself going in circles as you try to find your way. These inefficiencies will result in lost time and money, as well as draining you emotionally. A plan is not so much about staying on track, but more about helping you get back on track when you get diverted. When we don't have a road map to guide us, we have to use our judgment, and oftentimes we're left guessing. These decisions may have negative consequences for you and your loved one. The best way to overcome this is by self-educating and putting together a plan that will guide you on this journey. While this plan will not be perfect, it will at least point you in the right direction and help you avoid many of the potholes that lie ahead. As the primary caregiver, you have the role of project manager for development and execution of the plan. To be successful, you must bring all the stakeholders together and incorporate their skills goals, and responsibilities into the plan. It is also your responsibility to keep the care recipient involved in the process while they still can. It can and probably will be a lot of work, but the payoff will be huge. In this episode, I'll be discussing three components of the patient care plan. This includes a medical summary report, a medical action plan, and a daily care plan. Each component is developed individually and comes together into one document. In order to stay relevant, these components must be reviewed and updated periodically. Update intervals will vary based on your loved one, but a defined schedule for review should be written in stone. For example, once per month or once every other month. If possible, assign someone other than yourself with the responsibility of ensuring completion of this review cycle. After all, you need nudges too, 
especially if you're dealing with a progressive illness such as Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia. By the way, this is a great task for that remote relative who wants to help and be part of the circle of care. As a caregiver, you will be able to handle most things without much help in the beginning. But as the disease progresses, it will become unhealthy for both you and your loved one if you don't create a circle of care around them. Or think of it as simply a support team. This care circle or team includes both paid and unpaid care providers such as family, doctors, even the pharmacist, anyone who helps. In order for each member of the circle to provide proper medical attention, they must be up to date on your loved one's medical situation. And that's where the medical summary report comes into play. This report is a collection of patient information which enables care providers, including doctors, family, friends, neighbors, anyone, to make medical decisions on a daily basis or in the event of an emergency. Medications, health issues, prior medical history, and contact information is just some of the information included. Often, such as with Alzheimer's disease, the individual is unable to accurately communicate their past and present medical situation, so it's essential to have this mechanism in place to do this for them when you're not around. A medical summary provides this communication in a format that everyone can understand. A good medical summary will include the following information. Contact information for everyone including doctors, pharmacy, therapists, dentist, anyone involved in their medical care. Their current diagnosis. Medications and dosages including prescribed, over-the-counter, herbal, anything that they're taking allergies to medications, food, environment, all health issues, and treatment plans, latest test results such as blood pressure or cholesterol, past medical issues, major surgeries with dates, family medical history, Medicare, Medicaid, or any other insurance policies they may have, any medical devices they use, their health care directive or living will, their medical power of attorney. Now I realize I'm covering a boatload of information, but don't worry. As I mentioned, I will provide a link to the series of articles this podcast was derived from in the show notes at togetherinthis.com forward slash episode six. In these streamlined articles, I provide forms to use with step-by-step -step directions and examples. You start by identifying the emergency contacts and medications by using the medication form that I provide. Then you will expand upon it with logging your loved one's medical history into the personal health record form. Don't try to complete everything in one sitting. Work on it a little at a time. Once you have these two forms complete, next you should create the medical action plan. This component covers the information on how to provide treatment to your loved one if their health should decline for any reason. This includes minor changes that can be cared for in home or emergency situations that may require immediate emergency action. Now I couldn't find a quality form for this information so I created one just for you. It's quite possible your loved one suffers from multiple ailments. Maybe they're diabetic, suffer from a food allergy, or have a form of dementia such as Alzheimer's disease. Whatever their situation, as their circle of care grows, it's imperative to make sure that everyone knows how to deal with each medical situation that may arise. The medical action plan has three sections. First, patient information, where you note things such as their name, age, gender, blood type, etc. Next, there's a section for emergency contacts where you should note a primary and secondary contact, the name of their primary doctor, and the address of the nearest hospital. Now some of this information is redundant, but each form must be able to stand alone. The third and final section of the medical action plan identifies any special health issues along with the associated signs, symptoms, and actions someone should take if a problem does occur. Each health issue has a separate action plan. 
Most health issues have mild, moderate, and severe signs and symptoms. These symptoms should be identified. If the symptom requires self-care, details about care must be provided. Now, not all issues will have symptoms in all three categories, and self-care may never be appropriate. It's highly recommended to have your loved one's physician review this document. The final plan, along with the medical summary report, must be posted in an obvious location where it can be easily seen, such as the refrigerator. And every person in the care circle must be aware of its location and familiar with the information included. A medical action plan helps to ensure that when any symptoms strike, there's a plan of action readily available for whoever may be caring for your loved one. Sometimes the symptoms are minor and only require observation. Other times it may be a life or death situation. Again, regularly reviewing and updating this document will ensure that whatever the situation, there's a plan of action in place that anyone can follow. This will add a lot of peace of mind for you when you do get away to enjoy some me time. The last component of the patient care plan is the patient daily care plan. This component helps to ensure that the daily needs of your loved one as well as yourself are met. This is the most elaborate component of the care plan, whereas the medical summary and the medical action plan involve gathering and organization of data, this component involves more planning, organization, and collaboration with your loved one's care circle. Because of the amount of work required, you will want to break this into bite-sized chunks. Take it one step at a time by working on it a little each day or week. Don't wait any longer, though. Get started now. The patient daily care plan has three components. First, performing a caregiver self-evaluation. Second, performing an evaluation of the care recipient. And third, identifying and filling gaps in the daily care plan. Performing a self-evaluation is critical because assessing your abilities and limitations will highlight where you need to supplement your support with resources such as family, friends, or paid services. Of course, most of this is in your head, but putting it on paper will help you see things more clearly. Start by evaluating your schedule. Lay out your weekly, monthly, and annual schedule. You're not going to think of everything in one sitting, so consider grabbing one of those extra wall calendars you received this year and sitting it by your lazy boy. Fill it in a little each night. Be sure to include personal time for yourself. As I talked about in episodes 4 and 5, if you don't allocate me time, you will eventually become overwhelmed and you may even start to resent your loved one. If it gets to this point, their care will invariably suffer as well. If you take a vacation each year, include it. If you go to church, volunteer, or spend time with friends, include it. And be sure to capture any time you spend caring for others, such as children and or a spouse. Next, evaluate your abilities. Your plan needs to accurately reflect your abilities both physically and emotionally as a caregiver. List any physical limitations you may have. For instance, if you suffer from lower back pain, you shouldn't be lifting heavy objects such as a fallen loved one. Or maybe you don't drive. List anything that may prohibit you from being able to care for your loved one, especially in an emergency situation. Next, look at your emotional abilities. Remember that caring for a person with Alzheimer's will push your emotions to extremes that you have likely never experienced. Be honest with yourself. Are you a very patient person or are you easily agitated? Maybe you struggle with depression or maybe you're always happy. Although this area of self-evaluation is sensitive, have someone close to you review your self-assessment. Putting too much responsibility on yourself will cause the plan to break down. The last part of the self-evaluation is to evaluate your financial and legal situation. Caring for a person with Alzheimer's or another form of dementia will likely have both financial and legal implications for you. 
In order to minimize the negative implications, you must fully understand your own state of affairs. This will help you make informed decisions throughout the caregiving experience. As the primary caregiver, it's your responsibility to provide the best care possible for your loved one. And your self-evaluation will help you identify where additional resources are needed, thereby protecting your health and livelihood while providing optimum care for your loved one. Next, you want to evaluate your loved one's situation. During the process, be sure to discuss their personal goals and wishes with them if they still can. Assessing your loved one's care needs, state of affairs, and available resources is essential to putting together a good care plan. Start by evaluating their care needs. Care needs include both medical and personal requirements to ensure their health, safety, and well-being. If you haven't already, you should get access to their medical records by contacting their doctor and explaining that you're their primary caregiver. You may need to submit a HIPAA waiver that the doctor's office should be able to provide. As you carry out their evaluation, be sure to identify any issues of which you may be aware. Discuss their capabilities and limitations with anyone that is around them. For instance, do they have a hearing aid or use a walker to get around? Or do they need help with activities of daily living? If your loved one's health is in an advanced state of decline, it may be best to get in a comprehensive geriatric assessment by a healthcare professional. Talk to their doctor to see if they need this level of assessment. Don't just focus on their medical needs. Be sure to document their personal needs as well. Things such as social activities or a favorite TV show should be noted. These are the things that make us happy and should not be overlooked. Next, you want to evaluate their state of affairs. The care plan should accurately reflect their legal and financial situation. Start by creating a list of their legal documents. This includes documents such as a medical and financial power of attorneys, living will, last will and testament, deeds on assets such as a home, or other contracts they may have in place. Next, documenting their financial assets and liabilities will help you plan for payment of services and avoid potential pitfalls that may arise from debts. Don't worry, I'll provide forms to guide you. If you are their agent on their financial power of attorney, then you're off to a good start. If you don't have their POAs, medical or financial in place, then you should also start helping with this very important task. The final step is to evaluate their resources. Put together a list of everyone that can be trusted to help. Talk to each person and have them assess their commitment and role in supporting your loved one. Maybe they can help with yard work on the weekends or pay bills in the evening. Every little bit helps. Understand, however, that not everyone will be able to deal with the rigors of caregiving. This is especially true if you're dealing with a progressive illness such as Alzheimer's disease. While people will have good intentions, they may not be able to routinely provide the level of support they commit to initially. Encourage them to be realistic with their commitments. If your loved one's health is declining, here's a point that I can't emphasize enough. Begin looking for local services now. Right now, you have more bandwidth than you will have in the future. Many of these services are free, while others cost. Rather than wasting your time searching the Internet to find these services, start by contacting one of your local aging services. Use eldercare.gov to streamline the process, or maybe stop by your local senior center. They may have information to help. If you're dealing with dementia, you can also contact the social workers at some of your local memory care facilities. These people should be able to quickly point you in the right direction. As mentioned previously, if your loved one does not have medical and financial power of attorney appointed, then you need to read my article about the essential legal documents to have in place. This concludes the care recipient evaluation discussion. The final piece of the care plan is how to identify and fill gaps in the daily care plan. It's also the most complicated. 
Once in place, however, it will benefit anyone with care needs, whether they're rehabilitating from an accident or have Alzheimer's disease. To accurately complete this component, you must work with everyone that you have identified as being part of the care circle. These are the resources that you previously identified under your loved one's evaluation. Some people will be hesitant to commit and others will overcommit. So you, as the project manager, will need to adjust the plan throughout the process based on everyone's actual input. In the previous section on evaluating the care recipient, I discussed how to develop a list of needs or tasks and resources. If you did not do this, you will need to do this before you can complete this process. Start by laying out the task and needs in the planning worksheet that I created for you. To be honest, those of you who are Excel junkies will love this tool, but those of you who are not will probably just want to lay it out on a piece of paper or on a calendar. Just remember that you need something that's easy to modify and can be shared with others in the care circle. The worksheet has two major sections, recurring tasks and one-time events. Recurring tasks include tasks that occur regularly, if not daily. These are tasks such as lunch or exercise. One-time events include things such as appointments, birthdays, or a family member's soccer game. You input all of the tasks that you previously identified in sequential order. You will then identify the person or organization responsible for completing the task. There's a place to add any details that will help make the completion of the task successful. Patient preferences or addresses of appointments are examples. As you continue to complete the worksheet, you may start to see gaps in care. Resist the temptation to put your name next to all of the gaps. Work to fill these gaps with other resources. As the primary care partner, you will invariably see your name next to the majority of tasks already. And as I keep saying, be sure to include some me time in this plan. Failure to adhere to this rule will put the long-term success of this plan at risk because your health will suffer. If you're not taking care of yourself, the quality of care you give your loved one will suffer as well. Remember, no plan is perfect. A plan success is measured by one's ability to adjust the plan when unforeseen changes or challenges, resource limitations, or behavioral changes occur. When dealing with the disease such as Alzheimer's, which erodes a person's abilities, each day may be different and the individual's lucidity may change from minute to minute. What works one day may fail miserably the next, but will then work again next week. The daily care plan should not be rigid. It should be quite the opposite. It must be flexible. If it's not working, you must be willing to modify the plan. Flexibility, creativity, and adaption are all key to success. And as I previously said, I highly recommend that you assign someone to nudge you periodically to ensure the plan is being reviewed and updated periodically. We all become complacent, but as a caregiver, you will likely be overwhelmed at times. You will find yourself being reactive and not proactive. So a friendly nudge should be a welcome thing. During the review process, you not only need to evaluate the current situation, but you want to anticipate what changes may occur. This is especially true when caring for someone with Alzheimer's disease or another dementia. For instance, maybe mom is still cooking, but you're starting to worry about her interaction with the gas stove. As a result, you may need to plan to have someone help prepare meals. Or suppose you're still maintaining a career but dad needs more help during the day. Your plan needs to anticipate these changes so you can arrange your finances for hiring paid help to supplement your efforts if needed. If your loved one has Alzheimer's disease, I recommend you acquaint yourself with the seven stages of Alzheimer's disease. Remember, however, that each person progresses through the disease differently, so don't look at the stages with rigid expectations. Use them to be aware of what will eventually occur. These stages also focus on loss, so as I discussed in previous episodes, 
be sure to focus on what abilities remain. And with Alzheimer's disease, remember, nothing is routine. There's no stability. Every patient and situation is different. And practice patience, love, and adaptation. That concludes today's episode. I know I've covered a lot of information, but you can do this. Do a little at a time. Make a commitment to do it. Creating a plan is an investment of time that with perseverance will pay huge dividends. A well thought out care plan will help you maximize the quality of life for both the care recipient and you, the caregiver. Thank you for joining me for this episode. Be sure to head over to the show notes to get all the reference resources at togetherinthis.com forward slash episode 6. And I, again, know it's going to be a lot of work, but the worksheets and the articles will walk you step by step through it, and there are good examples. I look forward to having you join me in episode 7, where I'll take a step back and discuss some basic but important information about Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Bye now, and be sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. You've been listening to The Alzheimer's Podcast with Mike Good of Togetherness. For more information and to get the resources mentioned in this episode, visit togetherness.com forward slash podcast.